Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm delighted to have with me today Gerald Fussell. He is the uh, principal of Lake Trail Middle School, which is in the Comox Valley of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Um, Gerald, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Absolutely. So tell us a quick description of your school. What are the students and families that you serve? What's your sort of general instructional approach at your middle school? What are you trying to make happen? Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're a community middle school. Um, we had about 300 and, uh, we were up at about 370, 370 students this year, but we're a grade six to nine middle school. Um, I've often described we're in the process of transitioning from a junior secondary to a legitimate middle school. Um, and we've been doing that work over the last four years. Um, we serve a low socioeconomic community, a lot of high needs. Um, in our district, there are four very high needs elementary schools, three of them feed our school. Um, so we've got a lot of vulnerability. Um, our staff have worked really hard um, over, over, the, over the years to work, especially on trauma-informed practice, um, understanding vulnerability, meeting student needs, diversity of learning. Um, we have, I would argue, probably a unique structure um, that we brought in three years ago. Um, all of our classes are split classes. So we've got seven, or this year we had eight divisions of six, seven splits, and we had six divisions of eight, nine splits. Um, and what they do is so basically if I've got a homeroom, I've got a teaching partner, say you're my teaching partner, we're responsible for meeting the needs of all, you know, 56 of those kids in all curricular areas. How we do it is up to us. And so you see a lot of diversity between the different teams. Um, and then they actually sort of team up themselves as well. So that's sort of the structure and, and the school. So Gerald, I think I just heard you say that two teachers share a group of 50, 60 students and they teach all the subjects? That's correct. So we hire generalists. Um, and so for us, um, and, and every team functions a little bit differently. Um, some teams we've got the homeroom teacher keeps their students for all, you know, all core learning. Um, they work with a partner in terms of planning and that in terms of timetabling, they all have a common prep. Um, they have two common preps a week um, where they can work together. Um, and then there's a, there are others, especially our eight nines, where one of the teaching partners might take more of the math sciences curricula and the other one might take more of a lead in humanities, although our push is towards generalists and um, cross-curricular integration. So it strikes me that given your past work around um, diverse learning and trauma-informed practices and this flexibility adaptab adaptability that you've created with these teacher teams and so on, that in many ways you may have been ideally poised uh, when you had to shift to remote. So talk to me a little bit about what worked as you made those shifts and maybe what some challenges were that still existed. Um, I, I would, the, the one, there's one other piece that I would say did set us up to be ideally set for this, and that is we're used to um, being flexible. It's one of, the, so one of the key parts of our school is flexibility, has been for, for a long time. Um, at the beginning, we all, the one thing I did forget in the introduction is we're also in a major reconstruction. So we've got a major renovation going as we're building a new school while we're in part of the old school. Um, so we had that going on. And at the beginning of the year, I had t-shirts made up for our staff that said, embrace the chaos. Um, because we were taking on the construction, I had no idea what was really going to happen. So I'm not actually having any t-shirts made up next year because I'm afraid it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, yeah, we, I, I believe we were ideally set up um, for a number of reasons. Um, as everyone has talked about in the, in the conversations and that, we were lucky that we were two thirds of the way through the year before this happened. Um, our school really focuses on relationships. Um, and so it's, it's about relationships first. I mean, our school goal is how can we make each child's life better and meeting them where they're at. Um, and that's really been a part of our mantra, especially for the past three years or so. The homeroom structure was also a huge asset. Um, and then our ability to handle chaos um, and to respond. Um, we were very fluid um, in, in terms of our responses. So when we got the notification, um, we got notification going into spring break that um, none of us were allowed to travel out of the country um, because we'd likely have to be quarantined. Things were ramping up. And then partway through our spring break, we have a two-week spring break. A number of us as administrators got together, went, 
okay, this is coming at us. And we sort of wrote off our spring break and started planning um, and working with the district to come up with plans. So by the time we got back from spring break, we sort of had a, a sense of what needed to happen. Um, as we moved to remote learning, um, I, in hindsight, there were a couple of things we did that really paid huge dividends. Number one, because we had the home room structure, where one teacher is responsible for their 25, 27, 28 kids. And what we did is we really emphasized that all communication with home had to be through that homeroom teacher. So even though we have support staff, even though we have different teachers helping out, it all the, the, the homeroom teacher had to control the learning program for the kids, working with the parents and the students. Um, that, that actually made a huge, huge difference in, in what we did because we didn't get a lot of the reports of overloaded with multiple platforms, things like that. I mean, it was still there and we had to get better at it, but um, I think that was a real advantage for us. Um, our teachers after the first week were absolutely exhausted um, because of, well, we actually said it, we're going to take a week to get set up. And in that week, all of our homeroom teachers made personal contact with every set of parents. And in some cases, we've got multiple sets of parents. Um, but those conversations were emotionally exhausting. Some of them went two, two and a half hours um, with parents who were scared, unsure, you know, and our, and our teachers did. So that, that personal contact, again, paid huge dividends um, for us. The other thing we decided right early was um, we wanted to limit the number of applications and increase the number of people using them. So um, we started a little more fragmented than we ended up, but that was one of the things that we, we sort of went out right out of the gate um, was limiting apps and then all of the apps, because one of the concerns we had was, you know, there was a proliferation of free apps um, and I, I don't believe anything's free. So um, our, our teacher librarian, um, all apps had to be vetted through her before we use them. And then we tried to reduce the number of different ones we were using. We tried to reduce the number of platforms um, our school was also really well set up in that we use continuous reporting in ePortfolios. So our parents and our students were used to using that ePortfolio platform. Um, what we found is because we were already up on that platform, a, a number stayed there and then a number used Teams. So we still had two. As we worked through this, we started to graduate more towards Teams because of the utility it had, especially the communication tools. So you know, to answer your, I think I answered great to answer your question. It, it was that homeroom structure and that key contact, controlling the learning, working with students and parents to create that learning environment that was crucial. So, Gerald, I know you're a big advocate of rich, robust learning experiences for students, right? Uh, learning work that goes beyond traditional worksheet, textbook, homework packet type learning, right? So, how, how did you accomplish some of that? How do your teachers uh, make that happen from a distance? Um, some, some, some found more success with that than others. Um, some found more success as we went along. Um, it, it, it's hard and disconcerting to let go when you're also trying to deal with and trying to make sense of the chaos that's around you. Um, there, were, there were a few things we did. We, we are very fortunate in that we also have some targeted um, uh, targeted support teachers. So we have a full-time art uh, person, a full-time teacher that is responsible for providing exploratories and electives for our students in the arts. So what we asked him to do is provide um, extension, provide curriculum, provide activities for kids that introduce and capitalize on the arts. Um, we did the same thing. We have um, our, our foods area. Um, Justin is really good and we had, he was doing tutorials online. He was providing healthy lifestyles stuff and so instead of they didn't have any direct contact with the kids but they created um, a, a plethora of opportunities that teachers could go and grab and use to support their learning so it took some of the pressure off the homeroom teachers and augmented and enriched a lot of the programs too and then what we did is we actually met as a staff every week and shared what we were doing and ideas um, and so we were collaborative like we were building our own capacity um, and collaborations we were going and we were we were trying to collect the story so I would ask people to send me stories of things that were working well think good news stories I sort of picked up John Krasinski's you know some good news and it's like please give me some good news because right now everyone's getting inundated with horrible news 
shared it in our newsletter, shared it in our meetings, and that helped bring, build some of the confidence um, for people to try different things um, as we got feedback. Um, you know, was it, was it a perfect science? No, I mean, some of our kids needed much more tactile um, supports. Um, the other thing we did, we were really fortunate our tech department in the district moved really quickly. So as we identify, I mean, one of the first things we did is the conversations with parents is identifying tech needs. We found that actually parents miscon parent parents didn't quite understand how much tech they needed. So it took us a couple of weeks to find out, hey, wait a minute, no, you don't have enough tech. No, you don't have enough to do this. Um, and our tech department moved so quickly. So we got 40 laptops out into homes, got people set up within the first three weeks. Um, which also which also made a big difference. So we made sure that everyone had the tech they needed um, to support what we were doing. Awesome. So you know you have this wonderful school that prides itself on flexibility and adaptability and some really interesting sort of teacher student groupings happening and so on. What are some new things that emerged this spring that you want to hang on to in the fall? Um, it, it's an excellent question. I mean, one of the things I think we have to realize is that um, as a system, we're exhausted. So introducing new things at this point is, 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 a, is a bad idea as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our process. We have for the last three weeks to a month been surveying parents, students, teachers. We've been collecting, the teachers have been collecting feedback from them as well through assignments and that. Um, in terms of what's been successful, what hasn't been successful. And we've been putting that together into creating a plan for September. Um, we've got a staff meeting on, we've sort of roughed out the plan now at, at our meeting on Thursday. We're gonna go through and try to get some more granular details. What are we missing? Um, so, that, so that we can go into the summer knowing that no matter what we're facing in September, we've actually got a plan for it and how to address it. Yeah, and I think that's what I was thinking is, what are some of those new skill sets or processes that have maybe emerged, right, that are worth hanging on to? Yeah. Um, so our priorities in September, and our priority in September has always been about building relationship quickly, but our, no matter what the platform is, our priorities in September um, are going to be processing what we've experienced, because we've got to make sure that our, 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 our learning community is physiologically and psychologically ready. So it'll be processing that. We're focusing on building community, focusing on getting everyone up and comfortable with one platform um, and and so that that's going to be important and then what are the key executive skills students need so no matter what we're facing so we're going to front end all of that in september um, the other thing we're doing is um, we've got some pro e days at the end of end of august that we're going to use where we're going to be looking at um, other ways to co-create curriculum what are some ways we can capitalize on um, what may be traditionally electives, getting kids away from screens, but teaching a lot of the core curriculum and things like that in working with kids? Because what we found is when kids, one of the biggest challenges, it's easy to point fingers. One of the biggest challenges we had was engagement, student engagement and motivation. Well, no kidding. We lost all of our structural power. So that being said, we have to meet kids where they're at and parents where they're at to engage them, to motivate them. And I think one of the best ways to do that will be through co-creating curriculum and learning opportunities um, to help them move forward. And that, that's gonna be a big work for us. Um, ironically enough, it's gonna be far easier to do if we're not face-to-face. -face. Why do you feel that way? If we're face-to-face, -face, we're gonna revert back to the egg, egg carton structures. We're gonna revert back to what we know. We already know face-to-face, -face, I've already got a schedule. We know, that's, we do that. But if we're so if we're face to face, it's going to be much tougher, I think, to get to those co-created um, curriculum and assessment pieces that I think will be much easier. Ironically, almost the more remote we are in some cases. Fascinating. So creative design within new constraints. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Gerald, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate hearing more about uh, Lake Trail and what's been happening over the last few months. Anything else you want to share here at the end? Things that we should know or think about? Um, it, it's, it's, and it's ironic for me to say it, I get that. Um, it's about being patient, mm -hmm. being kind to others and to yourself, mm -hmm. and recognizing that in this chaos, there's a lot of really good things that can happen. And we have to keep our most vulnerable 
a hundred percent in the forefront of our minds. Um, if there's any way we can take this and, and put more resources and more supports for our most vulnerable learners, then, then the results are going to be good. And that has to be our priority. What a fantastic way to close our conversation. Thank you, Gerald, so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Scott.